Hello, everybody. Eric Sweats here for The Gamer, back with another TG Roundtable. Joined today by my constant cohorts, George Foster. Hello, everyone. How are we doing? And Editor-in-Chief Stacey Henley. Hello, hello. Today, we want to talk about a few smaller games. We like to hit on the big ones that everybody knows, uh, but sometimes there's stuff that goes under the radar, and we don't want to let it slip by. So, George, you have been playing a game that you're quite fond of. Yeah, um, actually, under Stacey's recommendation, uh, so this is one I would have completely missed if Stacey hadn't been all over it since Gamescom last year. Um, So I'll let Stace introduce it, actually. I don't want to ride on the coattails too much. (laughs) <laughs> um, so this was actually revealed a day of the devs at Summer Game Fest a little while ago. It's called Hellskate. It mixes Tony Hawk's Pro Skater and Hades together. Um, the director of the game was actually one of the level designers on Tony Hawk's Underground. It feels very, Ooh. very like um, Tony Hawk's, like the uh, muscle memory that I think those of us who played Tony Hawk's as a kid just kind of have with those games really clicks into it. So I... Yeah, I played it at Gamescom. Um, was one of the big ones on my radar just because I loved Tony Hawk's as a kid and everyone loves Hades. Mm-hmm. Thought it was really, really intriguing. Um, I kind of was expected to be disappointed by it just because I feel like a lot of times when games say we take this great game and this great game, the result is never usually that great. We get a lot of emails from indie companies who say, we have done The Last of Us mixed with God of War. And I, no, you haven't. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no, we haven't done that. Um, we've made Red Dead Redemption a, a Metroid game. Nope. Um, so I was really ready to be disappointed by it when I played it and just be like, this is a cool skating game. Because we've had a few skating games recently. I haven't really felt like the juice in them. They haven't mm. felt like Tony Hawk's. Um, which is not the only way to make a skating game, but that's... What I, I suppose look for the most. Um, so anyway, the preview um, was part of Steam, uh, the Steam Fest. Next Fest. The uh, yes, Steam Next Fest. The um, first world is going to be out in early access. There's three worlds in total planned. So you got a little bit of the roguelite run. Got to see what the mechanics were like. There's one competition which is like the boss battle, if you like, at the end of the world. Um, I was really, really impressed with how well it keeps up this idea of it's like Tony Hawk's meets Hades. It seems Mm. really true to that idea in a way that I was afraid it wouldn't be. Mm. So what's the what's the Hades piece? Because in a way, Tony Hawk kind of is a roguelike. I mean, you play the levels and you start them over and. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> you play as a you you're in hell. So that's the first Hades part, and there is a lot of combat. So the point of doing combos in Tony Hawk's is to get a high score, right? Mm-hmm. You want to beat the pro score, beat the six score, beat the combo score. In Hellskate, the more combos you're doing, the more powerful your attacks are. So mm-hmm. it's a very linear level. It's a little bit like levels like um, Mall or Downhill Jam where you go in one direction and get to the end. So you have to clear the area of different enemies, and at first they're pretty weak, you know, just a couple of hits with a skateboard and they're done. Mm. And then as you um, beat them, you're kind of offered, do you want to go this way or that way? Which is very Hades. If you go this way, you'll unlock acid attacks. If you go this way, um, you'll get a higher jump. So you're making tactical decisions as you go through based on how you want to build your run, and you're hoping that you get lucky with the... They don't call them boons in the game, but as far as the Hades comparison goes, you're hoping you get the right boon, and you either go for, I'm building around um, acid attacks, so I'm going to try and get the acid outfit, the acid board, the acid um, stickers to put on it, so you're building that up, or you try and go varied, so you're prepared for kind of any kind of attack. So as you clear each level, you choose which one to go into next, and while you get certain points for getting high scores, currency which you can unlock permanent upgrades as well as temporary upgrades the main draw of it is you are trying each time to get deeper and deeper into hell in order to battle against the king of hell mm. that's Reverse the bit which hades. is very similar to hades yeah yeah and it's it's very cool how it does it so obviously each roguelike has like a different 
way of doing their boons. And for Hellsgate, it's like when you're unlocking a new like attack with one of your tricks, it's like a skating tape. So it's like you're watching a video of someone else doing it kind of thing. And then for for the like acid gear, like Stace says, it's actually outfits that you start putting on. So you get like a cool beanie or you get like sneakers and stuff like that. And, you know, it's it's functionally still the same. Like you're still getting the same stuff. Like you're still unlocking a move or a stat or a, mm. you know, a, a modifier. But the way it does it, like I just, I couldn't help smiling. I was like, oh, that's really cool. That's, that's how I'd like to see it done. Like it really suits like the... I don't. I hate saying the vibes, but it suits the vibes. It does. It, it really the understands well. the vibes. It really does. Yeah. Like even instead of collecting skate, which you would do in Tony Hawk's, you collect Hell Skate, and the last yeah. is an eight at the end. So it's still the same amount of letters. So you've got these challenges that really call back to what Tony Hawk's is, while knowing that your score doesn't really matter. Like mm. there was a lot of times when I was off in the corner, kind of trying to do, you know, trying to play it like I would play Tony Hawk. And then I would land and try and do a revert to keep the combo going. And instead of doing a revert, I would do like a spinning attack. And I would think, oh yeah, I'm supposed to be killing things. Like it doesn't <laughs> really matter if I score a yeah. high score over in this corner and like look really cool playing Tony Hawk because it needs to be part of like a bigger combo unless I'm specifically tying these moves to attacking. Um, they're not really worth anything. But as you go through, you unlock moves that help you attack. Like my favorite one, there's a heal... Uh, heel flip that unlocks a snake that shoots out of the board which one the snake will attack oh, yeah, things that. for you but also you can grind on it so you can heel flip into a grinder and there's no oh, rail there and that can carry you towards the enemy um no. so there's some really cool ways they use the skating mechanics um to build this roguelite around it the mm. flip side of that is if you have never played tony orcs before there's a, l a big learning curve i would say in this it assumes you oh, know God, yeah. a lot about how this game is supposed to work. Okay. Yeah, you get you get little tips here and there. Like when you get a new trick, it's like, do this. But it's been a while since I've played Tony Hawk's properly and it took me a good two hours of playing to remember that grabs were a thing. And I was like, oh yeah. my God, that's like a whole, that's like an essential part of my moveset I've just forgotten mm. because until you unlock a grab move, it's just like, you know what to do, right? Yeah. And turns it, out I didn't. <laughs> it teaches you the buttons, but it felt to me a little bit like um, when Elden Ring came out and everyone was like, oh, it's a really approachable Souls-like because they knew the language. They, they yeah. knew how those games were. They played a lot of Dark Souls. Right. I hadn't really played much Dark Souls before. I dabbled with the first one a while ago. I wasn't very good at it, as you might expect. So when I went into Elden Ring and everyone was saying, oh, this is so much more straightforward. Like Everything is like planned out for you. That's only the case if you already know what mm. to expect from it. And Hell's Gate's going to be the same. It's obviously not going to be as big as Elden Ring. But people like me who've played you know, all the Tony Hawk's games who go into it knowing all of... you know, I, I know most of the basic combos and what they are just off the top of my head because that's because I've played them for so long. I know when it said do a heel flip, I didn't need to think what's the button for a heel flip. I know what the button is, you know. So there's a lot of assumed knowledge but in a way i think that elevates it because part of the reason a lot of this other skating games don't quite fit is they're not tony hawks mm -hmm. yeah you know i think if you're going to do a homage like especially from somebody who helped make tony hawks doing it in a way that has you know no real um learning curve if you come from underground the game that he worked on you will know this one instantly mm -hmm. And I think even if you are in the case of like, I, I know Tony Hawk's well enough that it wasn't that hard to jump into, but still having that, the skating gameplay mix in with having to do combat and stuff, like it's still, there is still a learning curve there. Like for the first, I want to say 20 minutes, like it felt like patting my head and rubbing my stomach, trying to remember Definitely. to do combos and then do specific combos for the effects I wanted to have while also avoiding attacks and then like attacking back. And it, it's all a bit chaotic at first, but there's a there's a really good rhythm to it. Eventually, you just get it. Like, and I like the idea that, like you're saying, Stace, like it is there is like a lot of assumed knowledge, but I'm kind of fine with that. Like, mm -hmm. if you're, you know, if you're not a newcomer, then you can pick it up. But I like to think that this is for people who are interested in Tony Hawk's, but they just want to do spin on it. Yeah, and there's you know there's a lot of games that are for newcomers. You know, there's a lot of games mm -hmm. to a fault. Sure. 
there's been a huge, huge debate right now amongst people who have no lives about whether it's okay <laughs> to have yellow paint on walls. You know, there's this huge thing about making games too easy, too accessible. Does should this matter? Should we do things this way? Um, if you don't do this way, then playtest says get frustrated and all those sorts of things. So I, I think it's okay to make a game and say. This is for people who know what they're doing. I need to, Tony Hawk's not a game with a huge skill ceiling. I've just mm -hmm. said I'm not right. very good at Elden Ring or Dark Souls. I, I wouldn't claim to be a brilliant gamer at like taking on all comers in any any game, any genre. But I think Tony Hawk's is certainly popular enough that there's a lot of people who are going to go into this game with that. That's going to be the selling point for them. And I think mm -hmm. trying to dilute that would have been a mistake. Mm. Yeah, I agree really heavy mechanically kind of like your one of your other favorites george uh, hi-fi rush oh god one one video going without mentioning hi-fi rush <laughs> <laughs> let's let's just mention it Is all it, the time please do you think there's some crossover appeal there besides the the tony hawk appeal um in in the sense of like completely different genres but if you like great visuals quirky characters rhythm based gameplay and awesome tracks playing in the background then hell yeah like all of my hi-fi rush <laughs> homies right now i'll get in on hellscape i guess is what i would say <laughs> that's interesting because you obviously you love hi-fi rush a lot more than i did oh, i, I found it okay rush. um but i i really see the comparison between them yeah i think mm. i would go as far as say if hellscape gets everything right and you know there's some things that we want to talk about where it isn't getting right at the moment, mm. but if it mm. does get everything right and lines up, it could be a game like that where it has this um, crowd appeal. It probably doesn't sell the you know the millions upon millions upon millions, but it manages for people who are connected to the industry really make a a niche for itself and become mm. beloved. It it does enough fresh things and has enough attitude, visual appeal, sense of self that I think games lack. That I think it could become like high fire rush i mean you know i know you love high fire rush you've got the tattoo of it i think this is the type of game that people could fall in love with mm. and i yeah. there's, there's better games that i wouldn't say that about there's competent games that i don't think many people would love yeah i think a lot of people would like you know the best term for it i can think of and i feel like this was kind of ruined by high fire rush in a way because it was this massive juggernaut of a game kind of peddled as like this is something we can shadow drop but it's it's a hidden gem like, I don't know if I could say about Hi-Fi Rush now, because it did meet, sure. reach, like, some mass appeal, but Hellscape specifically, like, totally hidden gem. Like, one of the one of the games that stands out to me already this year is like, ooh, I better make sure I mention this later. Like, this is this is what I want to highlight. I know you feel the same, Stace. Yeah, I mean, for all the, for all of you as watching this, George did not invent the title of this video. We already planned that, so we know this is a hidden gem, because <laughs> this video is the first hidden gems of 2024. <laughs> so we're all aware that these are hidden gem games. It's just just, just, um, a, just a reference. <laughs> no, I know what you mean. It, it, it has that kind of um, feel to it where there's some indie games, games actually that I played, that I knew weren't really going to let you on or anything. Like, we spoke a lot about Paranormal Sight and we did the end of year videos, but I knew that wasn't going to really spread far and wide, even though I really, really liked it. Um, I do think there's something, it's not unique because it's just Tony Hawk's, but there's something about how Hellscape puts everything together that I think it could um, find an audience. Mm. Yeah, and the thing is right now, I guess moving on to some of the stuff to be not wary of, but be aware of, that it's still in early access and that really, that does show. Yes. Um, like when when we started playing say so i remember you saying like you're having some trouble running it uh, yeah and i i have a pretty beefy pc like i don't use that much i prefer my consoles but i, I went in like oh just just stasis laptop and then it was it was chugging it was not not in the best shape um so i think that's universal unfortunately yeah it's um ben at the site also played it on our recommendation and he had similar problems getting it to, to load initially it's quite a strange one because the actual playing of the game, I didn't have any problems with. I didn't, it didn't, yeah. um, there was no um, pop in, there was no lag. It all ran really, really smoothly. When you finished a level and it would load and load and load, and it's got like the, you know, the little icons, the skating wheel spins round and the main character's face like flashes um, pink and blue to like show you that it's loading. Oh, yeah, that's cool. yeah. And then that would pause and it just wouldn't be loading anymore. And then. Mm. Because it's on my um, my laptop, 
I was able to, you know, go in and do something else, and then I came back, and sometimes it would then have loaded, and it would be paused on the the next level screen, and sometimes it just wouldn't have, and I'd have to close it and start again. Now, the autosave was pretty good, so I didn't lose any runs that way. It's a little bit like, um, I know there was a problem, I think it was Returnal when that launched originally, and it was in a much better state, but that had an issue with not being able to save midway through a yeah. run, so if it froze, um, or if you just needed to go away, you lost everything. That wasn't an issue with this, but it, it wasn't really loading. And I, I I don't have a great game on laptop. Like I played uh, a little bit of Prince of Persia earlier this year, had no problems with it. Um, played uh, quite a few things about it. And I, I think Gotham Knights was probably the last big game that I played in it, and it oh, ran wow. that pretty well. Like It struggled a little bit, but it worked. I was able to play it. Um mm. But I, it's a gaming lap, but it's not a high end one. Game, um, PC is my like least favorite choice for all this. I don't have a Steam Deck, but I know they've said that it doesn't really work on Steam Deck yet either. Mm. Um, but I think it's probably made for Steam Deck in the same way that a lot of people oh, yeah. played Hades on the Switch. It just has that kind of handheld feel to it. I know Tony Hawk's not so much, but um. Yeah, I, I'm sometimes reluctant to go into the tech specs of things on PC because I know I'm not an expert. Um, but everyone that I've spoken to, and it's admittedly a fairly small sample um, size, has said there's been a few issues with getting this just to load. Once mm. it's up and running, it works. But yeah. obviously mm. for a game that's so fast, it's pretty disruptive to every time that you go to a new zone or every time you want to start over. Because, you know, to roguelites, you die a lot at the start. Um, having a take ages and sometimes needing to be shut down and rebooted. Uh, yeah. I don't think people who don't, firstly, love Tony Hawks and second, have to cover it for work, are going to be that patient with it <laughs> if it breaks so often, basically. Right. Yeah, it is a bit of a rough first impression. I spent the first five minutes, and I, I actually didn't have loading problems. I was, I was pleasantly surprised how fast runs loaded, but I did have, like, frame drops i did have like there's a there's a scene early on when you first get skateboard and you do like this cool flip move but like every single time because i've restarted a few times just for footage and stuff every time like the camera just slightly goes kind of wonky and weird um it's still in development i think that's that's just an important thing to say about it like it's you know it's not quite done yet but i feel i feel really confident about there just being something special about it like it was it was five minutes with it, a bit of like, ooh, is this going to be as good as they said? Like, is this? <laughs> well, I'm gonna have to say I enjoyed it more just for the you know just to, just to say, but I I'm really hot on it right now. Like, I'm really excited to see where it mm -hmm. goes. And I, it's worth pointing out a lot of roguelites do launch in early access. They, they oh, usually yeah. work at least, but it's pretty common for roguelites to come out in this. Hades being the biggest example, yeah, I think of that's true. That's strategy. Hades too. Do you know if they've Hades said too. how long early access will be? Um, I Ooh. don't. They have said that they want to be able to launch this year, mm -hmm. like okay, full launch cool. this year. Um, the early access, or we should say, the early access actually comes up when this um, when this video drops, which will be on the Thursday. We're recording a little bit early. That's mm -hmm. when the game comes out. So right now, it'll be available to download in early access. We don't know when the date is, but we know they're targeting this year. Um, they have said there's three worlds total that they want to launch with at first. I don't know if that'll be added to. The early access contains all of one. So, in theory, that's a third of the way there. I'm sure they'll polish things up to it and add different parts to it. Mm -hmm. But um, other than the fact that it's having problems working, it seems to be a decent chunk of the way done. You know, we're getting quite a big slice of it mm -hmm. in in early access. Yeah, I didn't, cool. I didn't feel like there was... You know, sometimes with early access, you feel like, hey, I've got two levels and two guns or whatever. And you're like, ah, oh, this feels like a bit, a bit bare bones. But I didn't feel that with Hellskate at all. No, it didn't like, feel restricted. I think because yeah. you automatically get so many different moves, even though your you actual attacks are pretty limited, you feel like the way you can chain them together, yeah. um, especially when you're grinds variables. and manuals, it, it does feel different. Yeah. I really love the character portraits. Those are very yes. pages. Yeah. It's just got such good style, like the music as well. We, we haven't really talked about the music much. I mentioned it briefly, but um, I was just nodding along. I was jamming. I was like, right, time to look at this, this music on Spotify. Like it is instantly, it's very punk, very rock, but it's very, it's catchy. 
Um, I did hear a few songs repeat. I'm not sure how big the soundtrack is. That might be an early access thing. But, you know, for, for a game like this, I think one of my favorite things about Tony Hawk's in general, especially the the remaster of 1 and 2, the soundtrack on that yeah, is just an essential part one of the, the best all time. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and Hell Scout nails that. Yeah, I think um, part of the reason why I think the art appeals so much to me is, and this probably is a comparison to Hi-Fi Rush, if you were to look at if you were to go into most gaming studios, I think, and look at their kind of design inspirations, they'd have a mood board that featured other video games. This game is successful. That game is successful, and they try and ape those things. Why we see a lot of games looking the same? They have similar kind of grimy color palettes. Obviously, everyone's going after photo realism. It feels like if you went into Hell's Gate's office or the, the um, studio's offices the inspiration wouldn't just be these other successful games that we want to be like. I know it obviously is trying to be like both Tony Hawk's and Hades, but I Mm. feel like there's just a little bit of something unique in there. We spoke a little while ago on the show, Eric, about um, Palworld not really having much of a visual identity because it was just Pokemon. I feel like Hellskate is one of those games that has so much visual identity like if this becomes a success it's kind of thing where artists are going to draw their oc in hellscape style because we saw a lot of that with hades yeah. um mm-hmm. it ha- and we saw that with hi-fi rush as well so it has that kind of i said it before it just has a real strong sense of self which is why i want to root for it even though it's took two very popular games and slammed them together it f- feels like it has a lot of confidence in its own direction in a way that some games i think struggle with a little bit they tend mm. to look at what worked before and how can we do that our way and strangely even though this is doing that it's doing tony hawk's our way hades our way it feels more unique because of that because it's very upfront about it instead of trying to disguise its influence which i think a lot of games do these days and also to that point like i can't you know a lot of the times when you see we're at we're combining this game and this game it's two like very obvious choices but tony hawk's and hades like i i off the top of my head i can't think of anything like that like it is it is very unique in that that's true uh, yeah even to the point where you said earlier that we haven't seen like any skating games recently i can only think of games that are trying to be like skate like you know it's one like ea skate mm-hmm. they're trying yeah, to be yeah, more simulation than tony hawk so like i i welcome non-realistic skating to come back like and if it takes a hipster with like a devil wing on his back to do so fine <laughs> fine by me <laughs> Very cool. Uh, and everyone can check that out on um, Early Access today, right? Correct, yeah. yes. Awesome. Steam only. Not not planning so far to come to consoles at all. It's not just an Early Access thing. They've said probably just PC, and Aww. that's a lot for now. Well, I yeah. didn't know that. That makes me sad. It was popular. They could change. It. They've done that with other games, but it does seem right. like they're going after PC. Okay. Cool. Okay. Uh, I'll talk about a game that also came out this week which is Banishers, Ghosts of New Eden. Uh, And definitely feel free to jump in and uh, ask me questions. I know I'm the only one that's played it here, so I don't want to just rant at you about how much I like this game. (laughs) I really Um, like the studio, so I will have a lot of questions. Yeah, I I am completely... Like, I've I've heard bits and bobs about it, but if, say you're like me and you don't know much about Eric, how would you... Yeah. You know, who's it by? This is a new Don't Nod game, yeah, which is... uh, uh, I have no experience with Don't Not games. Maybe ten minutes of the first Life is Strange, but Stacy, you've played most most of them. All, I think all. Um, didn't finish Vampire, but I think all of them. Yeah. What are some other Don't Nods? Uh, they it would be Twin Mirror. Yeah. Uh, Tell me why. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously they did Life is Strange and then Life is Strange Two. They didn't do True Colors or um, Before the Storm because that was Deck Nine. Mm-hmm. Um and they recently did was it Jusant? Yeah, it was then? it was Jusant then, I think. Okay. Which is uh, very good. Yeah, so I the, none of those games have like punching or or shooting with guns, so no. I never played them. <laughs> uh <laughs> but this one has both. So uh I signed up. Um okay, so Banishers is uh I, I guess the easiest hook is it is Witcher uh, but it's about ghosts instead of hmm. hunting monsters. Uh, it takes place in 1695 in the township of New Eden. Um, 
you, the banishers are a couple. It's a uh, a Cuban woman and a Scottish man, um, and she has taught him how to be a banisher. So he's a bit younger in the profession. But they've been hired to come to New Eden to solve a haunting, uh, and what starts out as a simple case becomes a lot more complicated uh, when the woman is killed by the ghost. Uh, it's a very powerful ghost called a nightmare. Uh, and then she becomes a ghost. And so um, there's a lot, lot going on in this game. It's a big game. Uh, I have not finished it yet. I'm over 30 hours in. I know I'm, I'm near the end. Um, <laughs> but the, the, the concept is that you, your job and your, uh, like your ethos is, is protecting the living from the dead. But that gets complicated when the, uh, your partner dies and the only way to save her, to bring her back to life, is to kill people and take their souls. Right, okay. So, is, there, is there like a morality sort of system then? Is there decisions like based on... Yeah, I know there are decisions. decisions you told me about like the different decisions that there are in the game. So this is a your choices matter game. Which uh, is um, specialty. <laughs> which, <laughs> Sorry, that's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a bit of a trigger word for me. Whenever those things come along, I go out of my way to prove that it's not true, and it never is. I bet that started <laughs> with Infamous, Eric. I know, I know you well enough to know that you were sort of first who played Infamous and went, "This doesn't matter." So <laughs> that, yeah, you're right. So the th the. The setup for Infamous, the the good playthrough and the bad playthrough, everything since Infamous has been just a slight wrinkle on that, but yep. pretending that it's so much deeper than that. Uh, when it's not. When everything is just the Infamous morality system, right? Um, I felt that way about um, Outer Worlds, um, and I wrote about it at the time. That game has very much has the illusion of choice yes i agree um what this game does with choices matter i find very compelling um there are there is this and the a ending and the b ending however at the very start of the game you're asked to swear an oath and you can choose if you want to promise uh your partner that you will help her ascend to heaven by saving this town, banishing all the ghosts, this will redeem her soul and let her move on. Not redeem her soul, but complete finish the the reason that she's stuck here is because of this haunting and it needs to be resolved. Yeah, so she's right. in a, a, basically a state of purgatory. That's the deal. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And to yeah, and so to allow her to ascend, you need to deal with all the ghosts. And you can deal with those ghosts um either by uh, condemning them to hell because they, they're they baddies or compassionately helping them ascend and you can take each ghost case by case and make that moral distinction with each case and whether you send them to hell or send them to heaven it doesn't matter because once it's resolved then she gets to move on so that's ending right. A ending B is you solve these cases and then blame the humans because everyone is being haunted for a reason. What? Okay. So, so you, yeah, a ghost doesn't just follow you, right? The ghost has unfinished business, but there's a there's a, a a tangle there. Like there's a reason that you're being haunted. So if you blame the human that's being haunted for being haunted, then you kill them, take their soul, feed it to your wife, and then. If you do that enough, then she gets to come back to life. So that's ending B. Right. So it's not heaven that's or dark. hell. It's heaven or life. Or, or reborn. Yeah. You earn that life by killing others. Right. Yeah. So at the beginning of the game, uh, after she dies, you you take a you stumble into a haunting and resolve it, and you and that night after the after that uh, resolution, you swear an oath to her. Uh, you you guys figure it out together, but you're like, I either A, I'm going to help you move on, or B, I'm going to bring you back at no matter the cost. And then from whatever choice you make, you can make, you can 
still take every case by case and decide, am I going to, is it the human's fault? Am I going to help the ghost? Like, but what, where the choices matter part comes in is that the narrative direction of those characters, their dialogue and their relationship with each other is informed by that first choice that you made. So, um, I decided I was going to bring her back no matter what, right? Which means forsaking my oath as a banisher, which means taking lives that from people that don't deserve to die. Um, but I, I made that choice because I love my wife and I don't care about these filthy villagers. So the character, <laughs> Red McCree, will help reinforce that choice, will help justify it to you. As you're doing these investigations, the way he talks about what's happening makes it much easier. He he will do the equivocating for you. So like while you're think, trying to come up with ways to justify why this person deserves to die, he's doing that too. Uh, I like that. Right? Okay. But if you had made sworn the oath the other way, it would it would be different. So the choice matters in the sense like the way the story is told and the way the characters act changes. It's not the plot diverges in all these crazy ways. It doesn't. Yeah. It doesn't because every piece, every case is taken as its own thing as you progress through the game. So there's not like branching path. It's just the way the story is told changes. The way the characters experience the story is what changes. And that hits. That rules. That's how you should do it. Yeah, I think one of the things that you'd mentioned to me when you were playing through this and kind of figuring out what you were going to write about, how you were going to kind of cover this game, and, and, and you were really into it as you were playing it, was you were kind of less interested in, I got this ending, you got that ending, but more, this is the reason why I got this ending. These are the choices that I made along the um along the journey. This is why this particular case, I decided to act this way rather than that way. Um, What were like... There must have been some who are quite hard to... You've made this choice to kill people, and oh, yeah. then you've been engrossed by this story. So what were the kind of the standout ones where you were either decided just not to kill them, you decided, just, no, I'm going to let these ones live, or that were the hardest to have to kill? Right. Yeah, so, so the direction it gives you is that in order to bring her back, the most number of people have to be sacrificed. They don't tell you you have to kill every single person and they don't tell you how many people. It's just the most number. So there's a little bit of like doubt in there about what you can get away with, you know? Right. I don't so, want to poke holes in the story, so I don't want to poke holes in the story because I want to engage with this like properly. I don't want to just be yeah. quiet. Just, but in theory, if you've decided to kill people to bring her back, you could just kill everyone, right? Like, yeah. That you wouldn't experience the game truly. You wouldn't be playing it the way it's right. supposed to be played. But that's something you could do. You couldn't do if you decided to ascend that. You'd need to kind of see everything through to its conclusion. Whereas I suppose killing people naturally comes with a shortcut. Uh, a sh What do you mean a shortcut? If there's a big case and you need to solve it to get out of heaven, you would need to go yeah. through all the stages of it. Whereas if you just need to kill the human... You, you always just... have to solve it. You all uh... Right, okay. It always ends with... it all. Every case ends with three choices. Are you going to ascend the ghost? Are you going to condemn the ghost? Or are you going to blame the human? I understand, right? The living, yeah. You can't just go into a house and just kind of blast through the seven well, people yeah, no, yeah. yeah. You, you don't just massacre every town as you go through. Okay, case closed. <laughs> Bring her back. Yeah, like, this is a short playthrough. That's so sort of I thought. <laughs> <laughs> Speed running it. Right, um, sorry. I asked you about this, the stories that were the hardest to deal yeah, with. Yeah, so... Having to kill people. Right, so... Um, like I said, uh, you, it gives you this leeway. It get like a, there's a little bit of like, you don't have to kill everyone. Right. So after the night, after I swear this oath that I'm going to bring her back, the very next case I run into, I could not kill this person. I just could Why? not do it. So, so the situation is, um, I get to, uh, uh, a little township and they have a blacksmith that's just useless. Everybody in town is telling me about what a, a piece of crap this guy is. He never does anything on time. His work is really sloppy. Um, they just want, they want to get rid of him. 
like he he's uh, draining them. So I go to see him and he's gone. His wife tells me that he's disappeared. She doesn't know where he is. So I track him down out in the woods and he's fighting with a ghost. So clearly he's being haunted. Uh, and through this investigation, what unravels is that the blacksmith is not the blacksmith that was hired to come join this township. They hired a master blacksmith from uh, England. He and his wife got on a boat. And while they were on the ship on the way over here, she falls in love with another man. And the blacksmith, the real blacksmith, is horrific. Super abusive. Is just like berating her and beating her. And it's just like a monster. So the woman who falls in love with this other man, they conspire. They kill this guy. And then he, he takes himself. Yeah. And now he's the blacksmith. Okay. So he is being haunted. The the man who killed the blacksmith is being haunted by the ghost of the blacksmith. The original and blacksmith. that's cool. And the ghost is just as much of a POS in death as he was in life. <laughs> and and my my ghost, like my partner, doesn't have any patience for this wife beater either. Like she's not on board with redeeming him or any of that. Right. Um, so wait, is is the ghost wife around? Like even even before she's ascended, so she's yep. there. Yeah, she's there. The she's a companion through the game, isn't she? she? She's right, your companion, okay. and you play as both of them, which I'll I'll get into once we start talking about the combat and stuff, because that's ah, like a okay. whole different side of the game. Um. So, uh, so my choice how to resolve this case is I can send this ghost to hell. I can send him to heaven, which makes no sense. Or I can kill this woman that saved herself from her abuser and found true love. And I couldn't do it. <laughs> and in order yeah. to bring your wife back, you need to kill her. Like oh, that's That would make it easier to bring your wife back. Yes, that's what I swore an oath to do, is to kill this victim, right? And I'm like looking over at my wife, like, are you down with this? Like, is this really what we're doing here? You know? Um, so yeah, so that very, my very first one, I chose to uh, banish the ghost, send that guy to hell so that they could live their life together. But that to me was like, okay, that was my free one. Like, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I looked at that, like everybody gets one. Yeah. And then <laughs> one free, one free ghost banishing. Yeah. <laughs> and so, and that, so that was not the only one that I uh, let go. But from that point on, I had to really look at every case to try to justify why it was good that I was killing the person I was killing. And as I said, the character uh, Red does a really good job of helping you justify what you're about to do. Um, there was a case uh, where there's this doctor and she's being haunted by her sister's dead husband. Well, I don't know what the word is for that. Um, and he's like, yeah, he's like this pompous. He, he's really a prick. He, uh, the, the ghost. Uh, and what you discover is that um, she was the doctor of the town. He, the ghost, was um, engaged to her sister. And he has syphilis from sleeping around. And she's treating his syphilis, but he will not take it seriously. He won't do what she's telling him to do to deal with it. He's just like, why, don't, why aren't you fixing this? This isn't my problem. This is your problem. You're the doctor. And she's like, if you don't treat this if you don't take this seriously you're going to give my sister syphilis and then you're both going to die and he doesn't care and so she kills him so that right. he does so now so i need she now infect the so she doesn't infect her sister so now i need to make a choice right and i'm confronting the doctor and she has no remorse most of the, the even when the people are responsible for the deaths of these ghosts they are not remorseful um, and she's telling me, I took a life to save a life. Wouldn't you do the same? And Red's like, yeah, I would do the same. And that, cause that's what yeah. I'm about to do to you. Boom. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, so all of these cases are like really complex, moral equivocacy. Like they've got really good, there, there's depth to it. 
um, to yeah. all, it does all, sound interesting. all the different w- cases. What's the individual character written like? So I know you've said Red does a really good job of yeah. exemplifying what your choices are, but one of the things that I, one of the problems I suppose I have with Don't Not Games, even though I love a lot of stuff they make, I find the plot really engaging. So I can sort of go a little bit off the, off the edge at the, uh, at the very end, but I think the stories that they tell and the way they tell them are always so fascinating. They do this moral dilemma thing, I think, really well. But some of the individual characters feel like caricatures. Um, they feel hugely overwritten in a lot of them. Where Twin Mirror had that Life is Strange had mm. that. Um, does Banish have some of the same thing? I I really love these characters. I mean, the everyone that you meet on the way is kind of can be a bit archetypal. They don't get a, that much time to have a ton of depth, and I think that's okay. But the leads um, are are phenomenal they're really well acted they're really well written it's really interesting to watch their relationship develop amidst this really high stakes situation because you get the sense that they are in love and they're together but they don't know each other that well um she is the master banisher and he is the apprentice um Mm -hmm. and they and then they fell in love throughout the course of being banishers and so her um her outlook on the world and what being a banisher means is much more like set in stone. She's very like uh, black and white. She's very, um, she's like a very stern woman and he is more open-minded, which really works for their, you know, that he has to be the decision maker Mm -hmm. through this. Um, And then you take her perspective into account when you make these choices. Um, Yeah. Yeah, I, I think their dynamic is great and they're telling each other about their lives in the in a way that you do in like a new relationship, like about, you know, your childhood and the friends that you've had and like they're learning about each other as you're learning about them through the story. Um that part's really cool. Yeah, I think it's I think the characters are really well done. Yeah, I think that that's a thing that um no don't not has always been very, very good at the exposition we don't realize it's exposition as they do character building they always yeah. find a reason to establish a little bit of background law a little bit of um you know place in the world where this character kind of belongs obviously banish is slightly different because it's set so much longer ago most of the stuff that don't know it's done was you know modern day yeah mm. um there's so much cool world building around ghosts and how they work um there's different kinds of ghosts and they come about in different ways because of the scenario in which they died uh and the way that they that stuff unfolds is really cool there's also this really interesting dynamic between banishers and witches in this world um because a banisher it is a very like mechanical role they're exterminators right yeah Yeah. so so while they that's quite similar to the witcher yeah, yeah, it is. It is in that way. While they do like utilize magic, they're not into the arcane like that. They're not like they don't really care about the afterlife. They don't really think about God. Like yeah. none of Very none of that true. stuff really matters to them. Their their ethos is uh, life to the living and death to the dead. So like they're just there to do a job. They want to help people. And all the supernatural shit is just kind of like part of the job. Whereas like witches are all the way on the other end, you know, yeah. they're like connected. Extremely with, with spiritual. Yeah. So there's this really cool lore page I found. I, I read like, I don't, I hate picking up lore pages and stopping to read stuff. <laughs> I hate that. They're, I think that stuff sucks. And I couldn't help. I was so compelled by these lore pages. One, one because they do a really good job of like, just highlighting the important parts and you wouldn't think that that's that clever, but it, it helps a lot. Um, mm. But I read this really cool one. It was describing what a banisher is f- from the perspective of a witch. And she calls them the children of Orpheus. You know, the myth of Orpheus is that yeah. he, he has to go to the underworld to save um, Persephone. And as he's bringing her out, he can't look back. Neither of them can yeah. look back. And he makes he it does. all the way out without looking back, but she doesn't. And he never looked back to see, right? So the witch is saying they're they are the descendants of Orpheus because they do not look back. I thought yeah, that was I like that. 
Yeah, I thought yeah, that was really cool. That's, that's poignant. I like that. Yeah. <laughs> okay, uh, so now we got to talk about the combat because um, this is going to turn people off immediately. Yeah, because I, from what you've said from that, I, I assumed the shooting would just be the execution at, at the end when you made your choice and it's like an investigative detective sim, but clearly it is not. Okay, you don't so, get 30 hours out of that. Yeah. So before anything happens in this game, you are sword fighting skeletons in the forest. Hell and yeah. It, and it's not <laughs> great, dude. Oh. It's not great. <laughs> the 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 counters don't feel like anything. There's not a good sound cue. You don't get a visual cue. Like the the dodging is like really stiff and weird and you're just like hacking, hacking, hacking these skeletons. And it's bad. Uh, but it gets good. It, it actually gets like a combat system that I like a lot. It just takes a really long time. Um, and there's a few things that I think make it really good. One is that um, the flow of combat is all centered around this. It's called a like, perfect swap. Um, and you, but both characters occupy the same physical space and you just switch between them. It's like transforming back and forth between the characters. Right. And they have different okay. strengths. So like when a, so like a ghost is really weak to um, the, your sword when you're playing the human, but then the ghost, if you don't kill them quick enough, they will find a corpse and they will possess that corpse. And then they're really resistant to weapons and you have, and you have to use ghost punches. That's how that works. That's, yeah. that's the opposite <laughs> of how that one works. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So then ghost punches to knock them out of the body and then you ghost use punches. magic sword. So that, I mean that that version of it is cool that you have to dispossess them, that's not the right word. Exercise yeah. them, that's the word. You have yeah. to exercise them from the corpse and then you can attack them right. um with the the mortal character. So as you progress your skill trees and unlock abilities, Corporeal you level you start to build in uh what are these called perfect swaps? And it'll be like um, dodge and then swap, or it'll be like a three hit combo and then a swap or a parry and then a swap. And you just collect them over time. And so you get to a point where you're weaving in these swaps, which is just when you when you switch characters, but it adds a hit to your combos. So like, so like what the simplest and one of my favorite ones is the man dodges forward, you swap and you transition from him into her and she's doing a flying kick forward. That, right? that does sound cool. It sounds and then, kind of rhythmic. And then she, yeah, and then she, she does like a three hit thing and then you swap back in your mid swing. So you're doing all, like, the, if you can figure out where those beats are and you get a flash on your wrist when it, you're supposed to do a perfect swap because it's sort of hard to remember all the different things that trigger it. Sure. So it, if you, yeah, so you look for that flash and that's when you swap. But if you can do it good, then you get this really cool flow. Um, through combat, but it takes a while to unlock enough stuff to make that work really well. The other thing is the gun rules. It's so good. Um, and it also takes a long time before you get the gun, but the gun is just like one shot, just like blow a dude to kingdom come. And then it takes a long time <laughs> to reload. But if you, if the ghost gets a hit in at least one hit, when you swap the guns reloaded. So that's another way that you're like, trying to flow through combat that way i think it's I, yeah go ahead i think the downside with um it's starting so poorly is a lot of people are going to be drawn to this because of the comparison that you and other people will make to it's like the witcher and if you say it's like the witcher and then you drop someone into a pretty poor sword fight with a skeleton yeah i think immediately that's going to get people's back up it might yep. get great later on it sounds like the the you know switching system sounds like something that um, has a lot of mechanical depth to it, which is something that we associate with The Witcher. But <laughs> this is a game that I think needs to make a good first impression. I think, you know, Don't Know's game has been up and down recently. It's a new genre for them. It's probably going to have a lot of, not reluctant players, because um, you just wouldn't bother playing it, but I, I think it's going to have, to win people over, people will be giving it a chance yep. on the basis of its different influences. Um, and I, I think... It doesn't really matter for those people how good it is after 20 hours. It matters how good it is after two, if that, if it'll get to two. That Yes. And I think that's why it will remain a hidden gem. <laughs> 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 we're, we're calling it pretty early for a game that comes out this week. But um, yes, the if 
I got pulled through by the storytelling and found a really competent combat system later on. If yeah. if you don't click with that in that order, <laughs> the way I did, you probably are going to fall off this game pretty hard. Yeah, because um, there's some games you play for story, some games you play for combat, but basically that's not going to be the case Yeah, People aren't going to play this for the combat and stick with it because you need to do the story bit first, essentially. And it's also not as though you can just be like, oh, I'll just skip the combat and do the st story stuff. No, you are fighting skeletons yeah. all the time, constantly. And there's not a ton of enemy variety either. Um, it's mostly just like ghosts, and then ranged ghost, and then ghosts that possess all like a few different kinds of corpses. Yeah. They can possess dogs. Ugh. You know how much I love fighting dogs. We're yeah, back, yeah. back to that. <laughs> <laughs> it is funny though, because like the comparisons to The Witcher, um, maybe this is like a, a thing that's come way after launch, but it feels like a lot of people didn't really like The Witcher's combat either. Like that's the complaint I see the most about that game is like, oh, the combat sucks compared to the rest. That is the worst part of the game. Yeah, I think, and I, I liked it. I I really liked The Witcher 3, but... Yeah, yeah, I just, I think... Yeah, I think that's true. If you compare something to The Witcher, you're not expecting it to be picture-perfect combat. I think if you think of games with fantastic sword combat, you think of things like Ghost of Tsushima before you would think of um, The Witcher. But, you know, you start with Witcher, you've got the different spells, you've got the two different swords. Uh, it's clunky, but it feels quite heavy. Whereas I feel like what Eric's saying is, you know, there's no cues at all. You just kind of, it sounds almost like a VR game. You know, in a VR game where you just kind of flail back and forth until you eventually like get a hit. I've certainly done that when I've played um, sword games in VR. You just kind of flail around like you're on American Gladiators and hope that you can knock the opponent yeah. like off with you know, with your pugil stick. So you the, know, the you, you'd be surprised at like what my comparison is going to be, um, but. There's another. It sounds real like Hi Fi Rush. It does. No, you know what? I know this is going to be a bit of a meme now, but Hi Fi Rush starts off not rough, but it starts off not feeling great with its combat. Like it's slow, you don't have much you can do. But then as soon as you unlock the counter, it's like. Counter, magic. Everything just clicks. Yes, yes. I know you've heard me say it a million times, but it's true. So, like, from my point, Eric, you might have convinced me to give it a go because, you know, a slow start. It can be rough and it can be a pain, especially when trying to tell someone how good a game gets. Yeah. But, you know, like, Hi-Fi Rush is one of my favorite games ever, and that starts slow as hell. So, yeah, you know, I'm, I might be up for it. I think it's really easy to be cynical about, um, like, familiar combat systems. Mm. And because this, like, this game has loot, you know, uh, and it has nimbies. Uh... No. Yeah, it's got it's got stats and it's got perks. You and, almost but have it. yeah, so like it's really easy to immediately count it out because of that. But it it does approach all of those things in a really unique and meaningful way. Even its skill tree, I I've never seen a skill tree that works like this. You there's two upgrade points. One is. Uh, progression points like leveling up and the other is story points that you, you get a point every time you solve a case and the skill tree um, is multiple skill trees you, every time you get a new ghost power you unlock a new skill tree and it's kind of the spider web of abilities but every branch of that tree has two choices you can only pick one and then that leads to two choices and you can only pick one and every one is either a combat point or like a level up point or a story point so you build your tree but you are like picking a specific build where you turn abilities on and off that work together to to make your character and it really actually matters it's not just like 10 percent more health it's like your gun does double damage against wounded enemies and you're like Oh, okay. So let me do all the gun ones, you know, and like let me yeah, get the armor not, that it's works. Not a live with the gun. service either, is it? Like, it's not a game where you're going to unlock. You're not unlocking numbers so that you can buy a battle pass to unlock one, which I think is what puts a lot of people off with the loot system numbers. You are just leveling up. You're just getting better things as you go through the game. Yeah. You're earning better. Yeah, this better is very, arsenal. very deliberate build crafting and when you get a new armor piece it's not just a better armor piece it has one thing it does it has one perk and you yeah. think okay does this fit into my current build or is this good enough that i should do a new build 
for this new thing I got. Yeah. And then yeah. all your pieces can be upgraded six times. So nothing you got, like you, if you, what you got at the beginning, you can just keep upgrading till it's the best, till it's as good as anything else. Mm. Um, so you're not like replacing stuff constantly. You're, Which you're... is definitely a, a flaw that people find with these um, numbies type systems is that you can yeah. you build them up and then it's like eventually it runs out of steam and you've kind of yeah. wasted your time. You need to get a new one. Right. Yeah. yeah. This is like you you are trying to define your play style with your equipment rather than you're trying to make a number go up forever for the sake of number go up. And okay, I like I'm both of in. those I'm things. Like both of those kinds of games appeal to me, but mm. this is definitely the like you have a, a limited number of slots and you're trying to put the right perks there that fit however you like to play. Um, and then the the just the mechanics of swapping is interesting because your ghost works off of this meter uh, spirit meter. And so the human puts in hits that builds the meter. And then sh when you swap to the ghost, that meter is constantly draining. And when you use ghost powers, it takes a chunk out. And when you get hit, it takes a chunk out. And then when the meter runs out, you got to swap back. So you're trying to like build up to the ghost and then and then use her. And then you, you don't take any damage because it just hits that spirit meter. So you're kind of almost like invincible when you're the ghost. But then you only have a limited time you can be the ghost. Right. I feel like... um. I'm, I'm, because I've, I've literally, I've heard about this. I've heard you talk about it, but I've not paid attention to this at all. So I'm having kind of a hard time picturing it, but it still sounds quite cool. Um, Just I'm... picture like The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> it does, it does feel like you've described two games. I've got to be honest. It feels like you yeah. described one game that I was quite interested in playing, but yes. was surprised was thirty to forty hours long. Yeah, I was thinking, well, you know, Final Fantasy Dragon's Dogma. Maybe that's a thing for a few months' time. And then you've described a game that I think a lot of people would have a nice time with that just doesn't really appeal to me. Um, I don't really play a lot of shooter-centric games. If I do, they tend to be, um, you know, like The Last of Us or Resident Evil rather than, you know, a kind of... They're both combat-heavy, but they're not built around systems of combat, mm -hmm. you know, where mm -hmm. you are engaging with what's the best way to approach this. Um, that, I think, makes it intriguing because one of my big criticisms with that those types of games as I find them to be a little bit shallow. I don't think they focused very much on the story or why you're doing it because the point is just make the numbers go up. Um, so the fact that this one has a game that is a lot more engaged with those sorts of questions does interest me. But the fact that to get those questions, I need to play through the games that I don't always like that much. Right. I, I am... I am kind of on the fence about it. I think because I, I like to get across all the games that come out in a year as much as I can. It, and I, you know, I like Don't Nod. It is one that I'll check out probably after Dragon's Dogma and things calm down a little bit yeah. um, rather than immediately. But it, I've been sold on it tonight, but also been reminded as to why it was such a hard time to sell me in yeah. the first place. This, this, is, this is sort of my first thinking of it, but the length is a thing that's not not putting me off, but it's making me more like, oh, that does sound quite long. Um, it is, yeah. Yeah, and I, I'm fine with that if it's worth it. But it's you know, I, I probably will give it a go after what you've said. It's rare to see you so, I guess, surprised by a game. Like, I feel like you usually know what you like, but I didn't that's expect true, this to yeah, be your thing. More so. than I think most people at the site, you definitely do your research as to what games are about, what games are coming out. Mm -hmm. You tend to be very knowledgeable about the background of. Um, Games and stuff. I think that's always why you know we have the end of year discussions. You always have really interesting picks. So I think I we kind of tend to share a lot of recommendations by that point because we've swapped back and forth through the year. Um, so yeah, yeah. I, I uh, just I, I committed to it and I got so much out of it. I think that there's no way this doesn't end up on my end of the year. Um, wow. Uh, yeah, and but but all of those concerns like are completely valid. I also think. Not knowing Don't Not that well, I don't think this... I think this is much bigger than the kinds of games they're known for making. Definitely. Mm. Um, and I think... I mean, I know Vampire was more like an RPG with, like, Yeah, that's the one stuff. I have least experience with, but it was. And, yeah, I didn't and, pe that. and that got pretty middling reviews, because, like, I don't think the combat was very good. Um, this is. It just doesn't start out very good. 
and it's a long game. So, um, yeah, and you're right. It's like Dragon's Dogma and Final Fantasy, and people are still playing like a dragon, Ugh. and it's just gonna. <laughs> it's just so easy for this one to get lost in the shuffle right now. And maybe it would yeah. have it if it had come out at any point this year. Just but that's why it's a hidden gem. <laughs> they did. Um, they. I was ironically this whole way through. There was another game they made before this. I couldn't remember what it's called. It was Remember Me, which I should have remembered <laughs> because that's what it's called. Um, but that was another game that had more of these kind of combat systems in it. That was. It's been a while since I've played it, but that had a lot more sense of engaging with the combat mechanics as opposed to just doing them. You know, like there, there is a gun, a single gun in Life is Strange that you need to use at certain sections. But Remember Me and Vampire both had... Um, they wanted you to care about combat, I suppose, in the way that probably not as much as Banishers does, but in a similar way with the leveling up and the mm -hmm. unlocking um, upgrades and things. So there is a little bit of experience there. I just had forgotten it, despite its title. Is Remember Me the one with, like... I want to say it has, like, kind of... If Mirror's Edge has, like, a red overtone, then Remember Me had, like, an orange overtone. Correct. Yes, yep. then I kind of do remember Remember Me vaguely. <laughs> I'll, I'll, te I'll tease one more case, because I think I can sell George just on this one. Okay, go on. Okay. <laughs> okay, there is a... Uh, this settlement had two caravans. One made it to, to the settlement. The other one didn't. Mm -hmm. And the one that didn't the people were all killed by wolves and the ghost is a giant wolf the size of a caravan oh, made sick. of corpses oh gross but also sick made out of all their corpses yeah and and there's like a big twisty like secret about that whole thing about why they became a ghost and stuff yeah okay yeah i mean uh, to be to be completely honest like not that it's hard to sell me on a game cuz i do just love trying everything that comes my way but yeah, that's probably one more point in its favor for me to give it a go. <laughs> yeah, so it, it's got cool stuff like that, too. Yeah. Cool, imaginative uh, ghost stuff. Okay, long one. Let's wrap it up. All right, y'all. Uh, that's it for this video slash podcast. Thanks so much for watching slash listening. And we will see you next week. You can read more about both uh, Hellskate and Banishers. I'm the gamer. There are articles linked down in the description. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and hit that bell, and visit us at thegamer.com. That's the gamer, no space.